who is a senior scientist uh, from Genentech, and uh, his talk is um, titled The Analysis of uh, uh, Transcriptomes by Deep Sequencing. It's a little bit maybe technical. I'm going to ask him to, uh, as much as possible, to make it, uh, to prune it and so forth so that it could be uh, easy to, to follow. Uh, for today, uh, our guest speaker is uh, Dr. Lal uh, Ninon, uh, who, whose talk is titled Introduction to Medical Device Product Realization uh, from uh, Bench to Bedside. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lal Ninon is a regulatory affairs principal at Medtronic Vascular in Santa Rosa, California, who has been involved in the, in the worldwide regulatory approval of Medtronic's second generation drug eluting uh, coronary stent resolute. Dr. Ninon has seven years of industry experience in uh, multiple functional roles like regulatory, clinical, and research development of class three medical devices and combination products. Prior to joining Medtronic, uh, Dr. Ninon led research and development of novel uh, minimally in invasive uh, tish tissue uh, engineering technology at Cook Medical in uh, West Lafayette, Indiana. He has several peer-reviewed production sorry, uh, publication and also has one granted patent involving newer generation endovascular stents. Dr. Ninon's interests span not only the scientific of medical uh, technology, but also business, regulatory, and operational aspects of the industry. He received his uh, Bachelor of Technology degree in mechanical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Indiana, and Master of Science in Engineering uh, Mechanics and PhD in Biomet uh, Biolo Biological Engineering from Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana. So uh, here is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nina. It doesn't allow you to think too freely, but it is controlled for the safety and uh, the efficacy of the treatment for the patient. So I will, I know it's a, a whole big sentence of words like safety and efficacy, but I'll explain it as I go through this presentation. I just want to take you through what lies ahead beyond the initial developments of technology, how this is developed in this industry. The medical technology industry originated since about the 1950s. Um, so it's not very, um, it's not a very new area, and yet it's not a old drug industry, which has its origins at the late 1900s, uh, uh, late, late 1800s to early 1900s. Um, so with that brief introduction, I'll just um, 
forward with this kind of presentation. So, as I said, I the focus of this presentation is on the engineering and the scientific side of the development. So, what do I mean by that? In the business world, when you bring a technology into the marketplace, there's a whole stock business side of things and the operations side of things. <laughs> the marketing angle of finding out where you can sell this product, to which physicians and which hospitals, who will reimburse, who will pay the money for this. I mean, you have a $10,000 brilliant medical device that nobody's going to pay for it. It's useless developing that. So that aspect, much of the business aspects, I just touched in the last slide a little bit because of the emerging implications in the next few decades because of uh, political and uh, uh, economic realities in the world with regard to healthcare. But my focus will still be on the engineering and the scientific side of how, what does the science and engineering have to go through in order to realize the product? And by realization, I mean the ability and the license to actually use it in our patient, for physicians to use it in our patient. I'll go through the origins of the industry a little bit, just a brief slide, and then move on to the overview of the regulatory framework. And most of the focus will be on the US regulatory framework. Remember, every country in the world controls its medical um, technology or the drugs that are administered to its uh, citizens. So they all have a responsibility to protect uh, uh, the health of the uh, citizens. FDA does that in the United States. So I'll go through the regulatory framework a little bit with emphasis on, on FDA. And then after explaining that framework, I'll go through with an example on what is actually involved step-by-step step in a technology using a simple, very simple uh, medical device. And then I'll conclude with some of the current business uh, climate and challenges and what it means for the industry as such. So, origins of the medical device industry. The key question that medical companies like Medtronic or Cook or Boston and J&J, they all try to address is, how to apply biomedical science and engineering to meet unmet clinical needs. So human disease state, usually when you go to the doctor, you pop a pill or I get an injection. So that's the pharma side of the, of the healthcare industry. On the other side, you have everything from practical glasses to hip implants or coronary stents, which are the medical device side of the industry. And um, both are used to control and mitigate and heal and cure human ailments in two different ways. And I'll explain that in one of the slides, I think the next slide or the slide after that. But for the medical technology industry, it is how do we use, how do we bend, how do we manipulate engineering of physical systems like metals and the spring or electric current, for example, and neuromodulation devices. And how do we interface that with the diseased tissue now, a diseased tissue could be an aging bone. Grandma might be having an aging bone and you know, a hip fracture. And how do, you, how do you retain the function of the tissue with a mechanical implant? So it's the, the interface between the engineering and the biology. So that is the, the <coughs> fundamental science that's employed in this industry. <coughs> the origins of the industry, however, were very, very entrepreneurial. This is a classic garage industry. Whether it's Medtronic with Earl Bakken, who founded Medtronic in 1949, was in his garage when he wanted to have uh, an electrical uh, stimulation pulse generator, essentially, for a little child who had a problem with his heart. And I'm sure um, uh, Matt Bursoff talked a lot about the origins of Medtronic. Bill Cook in Indiana, both of these companies have had, uh, I've worked for both of them. Bill Cook started his company in Indiana manufacturing <coughs> packages. So his focus and attention was reaching the tissues in the body through the pipeline system of the body, essentially the blood vessels. So that's how Bill Cook started, and he made his catheters and everything in 19, early 1960, also in his garage. Now the key here is that these people, these entrepreneurs, interacted very, very closely with physicians. And they didn't interact, they didn't do it on their own. They, they could not, they needed a physician to actually help them with it. So the origins of the industry is with a very, very close interaction between physicians and typically engineers. And they are classic garage stories. So on the slide here, at the bottom you see bench to bedside. So the bench is the bench of the entrepreneur in the garage, and the bedside is, of course, the, the physician who is implanting it in a child or a patient or um, with, with this new device. But 
essentially it's not just a one way, it's actually bedside back to the bench. It's a physician who actually goes and tells, look, I have a child, he has a heart that's not beating very well. Can you do something about it to get this thing running? And the entrepreneur might think, hmm, he's how to jump a car, maybe the same technology can be used to jumpstart the heart. It's essentially at that level the thinking starts. And innovation is always free, there's no control, and there should not be controls on the thought process involved in innovation. And that's how the industry began. And big companies like Medtronic and Coke 60 years later, they're huge companies, they're more than 10 billion in, uh, in sales every year. But this interaction is at the core of, of industry. This from bench to the bedside. Now what is changing, and what has changed all over the years, in the last, uh, in the decade, is that are the controls that act when a product develops from the bench to the bedside. So in the 1960s, if you made a catheter, made it clean, made it sterile, wiped it down, yeah, you could use it. There's still, that can be used a little bit, there's physicians have independence, um, but things are much more controlled because of incidents that have happened both in the drug world and the device world which affect safety. And the mandate <coughs> for protecting safety is with FDA in this country and over years they have learned of various events that can take place. Not very common, not like one in hundred, but maybe one in ten thousand. But if that happens, they are dragged in front of the Congress. So they are they they are defensive in that sense that they would want to protect the health of the public. And so there's this balance between innovation and business side of things and protection of the safety of the public. And so that's where the controls come. And it's, it's very evolving and this back and forth between the regulators and the companies. It's a fact, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance between the getting the technology and services to the patients versus protecting the patient. So it's what's classically in the industry called as risk versus benefit or risk benefit analysis. Now, the problem is as the controls go higher and higher, costs also go higher and higher. Costs for doing the tests. So it's costs to show the evidence that a device is safe. Costs to show that evidence is will do the job what it claims to do. If it's claiming that um, it will prop open your coronary arteries for a particular disease state, will it really do that? Or is it just your company's trying to be snake oil sellers? No. It's, it's that balance that ensures that. But the, the, as the controls go up, the life cycle for a product, as well as the cost of developing it, goes higher and higher. So all this is to say that the development of this industry, as well as development of a product in this industry, is not just bench to bedside. There are, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a feedback loop with a lot of controls. And the focus of my talk today will be on explaining a little bit more on the controls so that from an engineering perspective, when you learn the sciences and engineering here, you can see the, how the engineering is kind of adapted into the healthcare industry. So that's just, I'm trying to do something that probably take multiple classes and courses in about uh, 10, you know, five or six slides. So hopefully I can um, do a reasonably good job of it. So as I said, the development of this product takes a lot of expertise. And typically in a company like Medtronic, you would find functional divisions under all these categories. There's marketing people, there's engineering, hard engineering and R&D, there's preclinical. This is the animal testing side of it, which is the primary source of data for safety. So, and then you go into the clinical side, which would implant the, the device which we develop into the humans. And that is how you show efficacy. That means it will do what it claims to do. And then you have the quality, to make sure that every time you manufacture the device, you do it the same way. Then there's regulatory, which interfaces with the FDA. Then there's operations, which will actually be in charge of actually making these devices. And then there's marketing, finance, distribution, and a whole group that deals with the reimbursement, how to work with hospital chains and third party insurers. So, so it's just, a, it's not a one man show. Remember, 1960s, it was just uh, Bill Cook or Arnold Bakken working with a physician. It's no longer that way. I mean, even today, there are entrepreneurial companies, but it, the, 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 data, the structure of the market and how companies bring product into the US is very, very different from what it was 50 years ago. The focus of this conversation will be mainly on this middle block here, the engineering, preclinical, clinical, quality, and operations. This is where the engineering and the technology side is. 
and I won't go too much into the finance or the marketing side. Um, although the last slide will explain some of the challenges that you're seeing from these areas, which in turn will affect how our devices develop. A little bit of a regulatory primer. So as I said, governments regulate healthcare worldwide. The US FDA does it in the United States, Health Canada does it in Canada, and name a country, especially if it's a developed country, there will be a very, very sophisticated uh, regulatory body associated with it. And usually there's a regulatory body for the drug side of things, and there is a division for the medical devices, and they're usually distinct. In the United States, uh, the US FDA is under the Department of Health and Human Services. FDA has its origins in 1906, and it started with uh, some of the uh, non-safe practices in the food industry, um, um, and it, its origins were 1906. At that time, it, was, um, it, it's not as, it wasn't as powerful as it is. It was more like an allopathy chemistry division of the government. But there have been important events that have happened in the United States which led to progressively amending the Food and Drug Act. Uh, the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act we have today is from 1938 with a lot of amendments over the years. So 1938 is an important year. 1962 is an important year. These are, these are um, important years in the United States because many of these drug regulations it's like safety and you have to show efficacy came about because of very, very unfortunate incidents uh, using drugs, have, you know, like women having problems with certain drugs like palomide. And uh, so in order, FDA and the government learn from these incidents, and that's when the new rules come in that, okay, from now on you have to show this piece of evidence before we will let you sell a product in the United States. It is interesting that there was nothing regarding medical devices till about 1976. So remember the days of 1950 and 1960 that I talked about? These were pre-amendment years. There was no rule, there was no regulations at that time. But in 1976, the government started the, the enacted the Medical Devices Act, Amendment Act. And this was in response to a problem with uh, uh, intrauterine devices. Many women were injured because of a particular device. And again, that just typically brings about, you know, every book so starts a big uproar, people are dragged in front of the Congress, Congress changes the law, and well, in 1976, you had the Medical Devices Act. And that's when the control over medical devices started in this country, in the United States. Before I go too much, I probably need to define what is a device, and this is actually taken from the FDA website, so this is a full definition of a device. Uh, I won't go through the full details of it. It's an instrument that's used for diagnosis of disease or other conditions used for the cure, mitigation, or treatment, or prevention of diseases in human or animals, so it's included. And it's intended to affect the structure or function of a body. Till then it's fine, but this is what actually differentiates a device from a drug. It does not achieve its intended function through chemical action or metabolism. The moment you do that, it becomes a drug or a biologic. So that's the device. So that's the definition of a device that it is not chemically used, or you know, it doesn't affect the, the receptors, it doesn't affect the cell cycle pathways, it doesn't have any pharmacological effect, it just affects the form or structure or function without doing that. And so anything that does that is a device. So that's just the broad definition of a device. In the United States, the devices are classified based on risk. There are three classes, risk one, class one, class two, and class three. Um, I've given some examples. Um, the class one are devices that are you know, less risky, a stethoscope, manual stethoscope, you can't kill a patient unless you whack someone with it, or dental floss. So those are the very low risk devices. And as you go down, you can go to class two, which have general and special controls. General controls mean you have to have certain labeling, you have to manufacture it in a clean environment, no, not in your garage. Uh, that won't work these days. Um, and class two devices of that category would be like a, you know, a clinical thermometer, for example. And then you have the highest risk class in the uh, United States, which is class three. These have general controls plus require prior approval from FDA, which means that you have to send them 
piles of paper before they will approve it. And typically in the device world for class three devices, the paperwork is not measured in number of pages, it's measured in number of inches or in feet of, feet of paper. So you run like 68 by 70 feet of paperwork with data. So that's all generated using years and years of testing. Devices of this uh, class would be like uh, coronary stents, which you put in the heart. It's obviously very life threatening. If something goes wrong during its implantation, the patient can die. Or intraocular lenses. You know, if something goes wrong in the way it's implanted, a person can become blind. Now, if you go through the list of devices, there are about uh, I think 1,700 classified devices and uh, in 16 different groups. 75% of the class one devices don't need any notification to FDA. Class two devices typically go in what's called a 510K filing. I won't go into too much of detail. This will be way, way too long at the top. And class three, we need pre-market approval, which means FDA will go through typical data using um, this uh, paperwork you submit. So let's uh, try something just to, to make this more co conversational. I just have uh, listed up a few things here, a few devices, and just would like to see if you guys can guess what the class of the devices in the US. It'll be different in different, <coughs> different countries. For example, Australia has four classes of devices. But for the time being, we'll just stick to the United States. Eyeglasses. Two? Two. How many two. ones and how many twos? One. one. Actually, eyeglasses are <coughs> class one. Um, good. Electronic vision aid. This is two things. Two. 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 Three. Um, two. No, one. actually, it's also class one. It's external. <laughs> it's an external <laughs> device. Okay. It, think in terms of risk. It's the risk that's what's um, making it more and more um, higher in class. So if it's life-threatening, it may save a life, but if it's used wrongly, if it kills a patient, that's where the risk goes up. So think in those terms. Preform plastic dentures. I don't know, this is funny. I just, this, all this is pulled out from a PSI, so. Two. 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 Actually, this is two, probably because of infection. If it's the, the material used, and if you're inclining it in, in your gums, eventually it can cause problems. Now start a little bit the trickier ones. Soft contact lenses. Okay, partially correct. One. One. Actually, it's two or three, depending on its daily use lens or if it's a long-term use lens. Extended wear. Extended wear is more risk. It's class three. Daily use contact lenses are class two. Wheelchairs. Actually, you should ask me the question, what kind of a wheelchair? Well, mechanical wheelchair, in which the, the patient actually rolls it with his or her own hand. Good. What if it's a powered wheelchair? Three. Two. Why? Well, kind of. In a way, you know, if you're crossing the road and if the power system on that thing fails, mm -hmm. there's a risk there. So if you start examining your power system again, it's a class two actually. What if it's a stair climbing powered wheelchair? There are stair climbing powered wheelchairs. Three. Three. Obviously, that's got to be free because if it fails, the person is on his way out. <laughs> that would be very funny, it would be very risky, and it would add injuries to the patient. So wheelchairs are class one, two, or three, depending on the type of the wheelchair. So I just brought this example to see you know, how the <coughs> risk is uh, mitigated. You know, how much of information would FDA want? So a class one would require, actually a class one requires filing. Um, and it, the paperwork would be about 20, 20, 30 pages. Well, a class three would start measuring the filing in inches of paper or feet of paper. You'll have binders like this. And this you know, FedEx gets good business from the drug and device companies shipping just paper. But then it takes about six months to review some of these. So 
And this is the last slide on regulatory. I would not go too much into it. Um, just wanted to bring in some names of worldwide regulatory agencies. In the European Union, um, medical devices are, they have a different system. The notified body, they're third party reviewers. Um, private companies, but they do the review for the government. Uh, in Japan, it's uh, PMDA, which is the Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Agency. They're very, very tough. Canada has Health Canada. Australia has uh, TGA, which is the Therapeutics and Goods Administration. Korea has Korean FDA. China has SFDA, which is a Chinese FDA, state FDA. What's seen in the last 10, 15 years is the regulation has been going up worldwide. Countries that did not have medical devices and in regulation are now bringing in their own laws. I mean, most of them have drug regulations. Remember, drug regulations started in 1906 in the US, so they have a 100 year history. That's trickled down into the rest of the world. While device regulations are only 30, 35 years, it's now only slowly trickling down. Partially because <laughs> companies are trying to you know, expand their markets to patients, like in India, for example, where there's a, a large prevalence of coronary disease, stents are being sold there. So, till about a few years ago, India did not have Indian, in fact, Indian drug rules do not even recognize what's a device. They put coronary stent as a drug. Now they're coming up and revising their rules to make drug-specific regulations. Same is happening with China, with Brazil, and Visa is the agency for Brazil. And they, all these worldwide regulators are increasing their control of devices being imported into their countries and used by their physicians, primarily because they are responsible to their governments to protect their people. Nothing happens till about 10 people fall sick or even worse if they happen, if it results in death, and then you know, it becomes very political too. I wanted to conclude, uh, before I left off this uh, slide, I just wanted to bring in some special cases of uh, products. They are neither, they are drugs and devices together. Uh, they call combination products. They are a medical device, but they have a drug within them. And so those are called combination products, and they are very, very sophisticated in the sense you have to get the review approval of both the drug reviewers and the device reviewers. And one of this is the drug eluting stamp. They're the most well known, and Medtronic actually does it, and I've been working on a product like that. Won't go too much into that. Um, it will take away from this um, conversation, uh, from, from the focus of this uh, focus. Now remember the first slide I said, as the, pro uh, the product moves from bench to the bedside, there are controls. I'm gonna explain the next two slides how these controls work. This is very, very, very um, top level, so I won't go into too much of details. FDA, or government regulators, control, exercise control through control of actually the design, as well as the manufacturing. When I say control of the design, it's not just the final design. They actually control the process of how a company designs it, how many revisions it goes through, what may you change the design. Everything has to be documented. And the big mantra of regulatory agencies is, if it's not documented, it was not done. No point in trying to reason with them. They will not accept that. Because documentation is very, very, very important. And so the way FDA controls, or the regulators control the design is, uh, mainly the regulation is 21 CFR 820, the quality system regulations. And the control actually started, um, formal control started actually not too long ago, it was in the 90s. So you can see that 76, the law came in, but it took 14 years for it to trickle down and magnify into individual areas. Uh, first there was a law, then it's now controlling how the design itself is. It's important to know that the early development work, when somebody invents something or feels like, hey, I know a new catheter that will not catch infection by coating with X or Y material. At that early stage of innovation, that is still not under design controls because that's deliberate. Innovation needs to be free. People need to think freely and not controlled. That part is still kept free from controls. But the moment something is finalized, if you want to make changes to the design, you have to provide rationale. Everything. It's almost like a, a court case. You know, provide the scientific rationale why you change things from X to Y. So the rationale comes from the science. So here's where you use science and engineering, and you use that to build a case for the change or the design that you're making. So typically, I'll just go through a few elements of it. Um, the early stage would be finding out the user needs and the intended uses of the device, which could be just being 
what's called the RP open. That will translate to what's called as design inputs, which are quantitative uh, analogs of it. So you want to keep a blood vessel open. How much, how big of a blood vessel? Um, or you want to have a wheelchair that can hold a 250-pound patient but can go through rough terrain. That means the wheels or the stability of that will translate into hard engineering dimensions. So the design inputs will be more of a quantitative thing while the intended use of, of the device will be more qualitative of, of how a surgeon wants to use a cutting device. They are translated into design outputs, which is actually the final design. You know, this, if you want X, you need to have a wheelchair with a wheel diameter of um, two feet, or to be manufactured using carbon steel to be light, or, or composites to be lighter. So that's the design input and then the design output. And within that stage, the, there's two things we do, and there's a whole lot of things we can do. There's design verification and then the design validation. Design verification essentially shows that your final design meets all those hard quantitative numbers. You will be able, to, I'll give you an example so it will be a little bit more concrete in the next slide. While design validation is, your final design actually meets what the doctor wants, which is a qualitative aspect. So this is just a rough field. One matches the design to the hard numbers, other matches, take a step backward, it matches the final design to what is actually needed. So give you a good example. Now it's actually a class three device, it's not a class one, it's not a simple example. Injectable dermal fillers. This is a set of collagen injections. That's the technical name for that. Um, most of the injectable dermal fillers are indicated for just one very narrow indication. Indications mean where you can use it. FDA has approved some of them only for one particular use. That is to reduce the fold lines here. It's called the nasolabial fold. That's all you can use it for. That's all the scientific data exists now. The practice of medicine is not regulated by FDA. Doctors can use it wherever they want to. Uh, they can use their medical judgment. But that's just a little background on the device. So uh, I'll give a little bit more of the background on the device. Um, these are usually collagens, and these are animal collagens or bio, uh, biochemically produced uh, collagen material. Or the latest one, uh, our latest ones are based on what's called hyaluronic acid. It's also a sugar uh, that occurs uh, in nature, but it's now uh, produced um, using biotechnology. Um, the cost of these products is typically a one mil syringe is typically about two hundred three hundred dollars, so it's very high price. No reimbursements because this is direct pay from the it's cosmetic, so insurers are not going to pay for that. So that's again the business side of each and every device. So I won't go into that, but to ex I just wanted to bring this as an example to see how the design control process works for this particular um, uh, this particular uh, device. So it's indicated for reduction of skin wrinkles. And so the things we would, you know, typically it's done by a plastic surgeon. Plastic surgeon is the one who actually administers this therapy. Um, go, you go to this, the surgeon, you have a, a procedure. It's a, it's a pretty brutal procedure to see. It's, you know, it's, it's injecting into the face. It um, typically lasts for about nine months, so there's a, number of times you come in, so you have to, the user will have to wave, do I have to come in every month for this? So that's <laughs> the repeat treatment thing. Then there's each of ease of injection and control. If a surgeon can inject very easily and it takes like, you know, he has to be a bodybuilder to get this thing you know, under the skin, you know, I'm gonna use it. And the patient's <laughs> gonna freak out. So that's, the ease of injection is something, you know, a qualitative thing. I want to inject something very smoothly, I want to control it so that I don't jab the person's face somewhere else. It should not be a very, very deep wound, so it's got scars on the face. Doctors are a bit sued for that. And it should do what it claims to do. It should reduce the wrinkles in this case. This could be applied the same way as coronary stent. It could be for a hip implant. These are the general uses. So this is what the uh, intended use, what the clinician and the patient, the user wants. How does this translate? I'll just say one of this. I mentioned uh, the use of how the, the physician wants to have the ease of use injecting this. That will immediately translate into a force, right? In this case, I'm putting a hypothetical value. I don't know the exact values. It's publicly available. You can go to FDA site and 
go to a, a, a PMA for rest tooling or some device like that. Let's say <coughs> that means you know the company will go and you know ask the doctors, okay, how do you fill this? Eh. You supposed to throw it out and then they say, yeah, this works well. And of course they'll translate it. And let's say that is three pounds, three pound force, using your you know, two fingers here and the thumb. So should have strain your muscle here. What do you think would that translate into your design? You know, a bunch of engineers, so we can get some feedback. Remember, this is a syringe, there's a needle, it has a material that has to go in and be implanted in the body. What do you think will affect this three pounds of force? Are you designing the needle or the fluid? The whole device. I'm talking from the whole device, but you're going into the components of it, and that's what I want to hear. What are the factors that will affect the force of injection? I mean, this is just one input. Yeah, the size of the needle. Very good. That's the first thing. Actually, the size of the needle. Now, the size of the needle also has other effects. The scar, smaller and finer the needle, the less of the scar. So there are balancing things you need to balance out here. But size of the needle is, is, is one. What else? Can you actually write the first one? Mm. Needles typically have a common bevel, so once it's usually it goes to what's called a 26 gauge needle, it's about this long and very thin. It's much smaller than the one people use to draw your blood. That's kind of an 18 gauge needle, it's a little bigger needle. The thickness of the needle? It's the needle size, uh, the, the gauge size will determine all that. The bevel, the size, and. The material of the needle? Um, the material of the needle. The viscosity of the liquid. Very good. The viscosity of the liquid, of what are we injecting. That has immediate bearing on the duration of the implant lasts. Remember, this is collagen. Collagen is metabolized by the body. It's broken down. This is type you know, collagen class one collagen from bovine or biotechnology produced one. If it is dense, it will last longer. So the patient doesn't have to come in every two months. It, uh, it can come back. But if it's dense, it's harder, it's harder to inject that thing in. So viscosity is a very, very important thing. One very simple one. Would it be easy to inject a smaller syringe or a large bore syringe? I mean, if you have a syringe which is this bore, try injecting with just your thumb, you naturally need your hand to inject it. So the size of the syringe. So syringe size, viscosity and density of the gel. So those are the three uh, ingredients that would be necessary. So, based on this, the engineers would decide, okay, I need a 1cc syringe with a 26 gauge needle <coughs> with 3 milligrams per cc of uh, collagen, hyaluronic acid. That's the best of course. They'll do a bunch of testing in the lab to make sure. And then they would actually put it under this testing machine and measure the force for injecting this. And they would show that that is less than 3 pounds. It's not just n equal to 1. It has to be statistically controlled, so that's where the quality group comes in, so it's typically maybe like 95, 90 reliability and confidence. We gather all this data, and so that part is verified. That this design, with this needle size, and this syringe diameter, and this particular class of material with density will now meet the three pounds criteria. Now that's just one design input. Now there are several others, actually, what's called a whole risk document, that's, that's called Deformica and Deformica, or and motor criticality analysis. A whole lot of risk documents go in. And so that's the process how you verify that your final design of needle size will meet, uh, and the syringe uh, dimensions, will actually meet each and every of the design inputs. But still, you haven't done the validation part, that it does what it claims to do. That's when it goes into animal studies, typically for um, derma and cosmetic applications, it's rat models or rabbit models that work. And they run clinical trials. They run blinded clinical trials where you know the injecting physician is different from the, the physician who actually evaluates it. So there's no bias. And they actually they have actually that's it's called a Fitzgerald scale of four depths. It's very, very scientific. It's all plastic surgery, the piece of plastic surgery. They actually would do a clinical trial and would give the data to FDA and show, look, we claim that we will release the fold fifty percent. And that's what finally gets signed off in the So you can imagine the number of years <coughs> that it takes to go through this, this exercise. So long story short, there's a lot of testing and documentation 
documentation and controls is extremely important in this. But even more than that, what you hold, what the whole team holds in its head is the story. You actually manage the product story because the product itself changes. Because after designing this, somebody would come up and say, I can get syringes of one cc for that plastic. It's an expensive syringe. You sell it for $300, syringe costs like $50. It's not going to work in the business side of things. So there are changes that happen. So you have to still keep the story straight, uh, what you're telling to your DA and uh, the customers. And so there's a lot of uh, product story management that goes on. And as such, I said, if it's not documented, it was not done. So there's a lot of paperwork. This slide is just a brief slide. Just like this control of the design, this control of the manufacturing process, um, the facilities have to follow certain rules. The, there are ways of controlling the intermediate process of manufacturing. In the case, how do you manufacture the gel? How do you do, you know, if there's a heating step, how do you control the heating step? It's a whole lot of things. The reason it's all so tightly controlled is as the sophistication of engineering goes higher and higher, the potential for risk also goes higher. And so you need a lot more tests to actually demonstrate that your product is safe and effective. I won't go into too much of details in the validation side and everything. So what does it take? Again, answering the question, what does it take to have this engineering and science applying to be applied to heal the disease states? Well, it takes a lot of resources. It takes trained personnel with a very strong scientific and engineering background. It takes good business sense, so you just can have the science side of things because companies um, do not do care for the, the profit side of things because they're answerable to the investors. It takes a lot of time and money, testing, <coughs> protocols, validations, training, and especially clinical studies. As the risk of the device goes in, you have to actually do clinical and what? And the cost of that is very, very high. Tend to figure around like ten thousand to fifty dollars per patient. So for a large trial, which is like thousand patients, that goes like $10 million straight. Now I come to the last slide. Given this set of controls and the number of customers that we, um, or stakeholders that are involved, it's obviously a very sophisticated process to build from scratch and then finally get it to the patient and distribute it to your physicians and then they get it used. There have been a lot of changes that have been taking place in the healthcare industry. You would have heard of the healthcare change, uh, reforms and everything. A lot of reform centers on the first two items, reimbursement and the regulatory side of things. On one side, the regulatory burden is getting tougher and tougher because of the risks that have come up, the deox drama, and all the risks that have come in. The product life cycle, i.e. the time from the conception of the idea to actually getting to sell to patients is going from three years to five years, and in some cases like drug product, combination products, five to seven years. So immediately that brings in, you know, investors are like, yeah, I thought I could put in two million and be out of it three million in three years. Now it looks like they seven years. So they're going to, you know, start scratching their head a little bit. On the other hand, you have reimbursement. Now I didn't talk too much about reimbursement. So the, the way things work in the United States, uh, you know, there's the FDA approves only says the product is safe and effective. They don't say anything about how, you know, how cheap it should be, they don't, they don't care about it. That's not their mandate from Congress. That is actually done by Medicaid and Medicare, CMS. And they have their own coding systems. They don't pay for <coughs> devices, they pay for procedures. So if you want to open your blood vessel, the doctor gets paid for that procedure. And that will be, say, let's, let's say for, for ease, $10,000. And the doctor uses a stent, or whatever device he uses, for that, and if he is charged three thousand dollars versus a company who would sell it for two thousand, guess which one he's going to use, or which one the hospital is going to use. And even there, the finer dynamics here, you know, physician uh, company relationship versus the the reimbursement director, the healthcare hospital healthcare administrators, it's a very very complex area and it's evolving. So I won't go into too much detail. I'm just giving you a little bit of a hint of how things are done. If reimbursement is now going to reduce from ten thousand dollars to say Eight thousand. So that's a cost pressure on the hospital. They're not going to care if your device has bells and whistles. They would care. We're getting eight two thousand dollars left. Um, how much can you reduce your stent cost or your you know this um, hip implant? Now cosmetic surgery is 
different because there are no insurers involved, but that's just a small part of the medical uh, industry. So what's happening is that there's a shift from physicians in hospitals who decide, I like a Medtronic stent, for example, to where the, 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 the healthcare person would say, yeah, that's all fine, Medtronic stent might be the coolest stent. I can't run a business here with that price of a stent, so who can sell me the cheapest stent? Eh, I don't care, but anyway, they're all playing the same thing, I'll take the cheapest one. So that, that kind of pricing pressure, so it's like the, the, the administrators, where then the physician and the company. So it's mostly a triad that's forming now. So this bottom line, there's a downward pressure on reducing costs. So all companies, I mean, if you look at, uh, at um, healthcare industry stocks, they have not been very high. They've actually come down a little bit, especially after the recession and the healthcare reforms. Then the third force is globalization. Now this is like a double-edged sword. That's a good side. With Many countries, especially India and China, expanding in their economies and middle class expanding and having bad dietary habits, you know, like invest in McDonald's and Medtronic together because <laughs> one will fall in a lottery and the other can go and um, uh, open it up. Just kidding. Uh, because of their lifestyle choices, with increase of wealth, there's a market. Aging population within the United States itself uh, is a is a market, and so that is the opportunity that companies have. While the risk is, the controls are increasing. These co the cost of these uh, devices are flowing into the country. The governments are introducing their laws, so you got to satisfy them. So uh, the opportunities exist for healing and helping people worldwide, but the challenges also increase. This is not a detrimental thing because ultimately companies are able to provide products to patients who otherwise would not have these technologies. So that's not a bad thing. But the first two are actually very, very, um, uh, form of almost what you call as um, undue burden on many companies. So long story short, the increased opportunities and increased risk. What does this mean on this whole process of bench to bedside? It just means that I can have an idea, and I may have a brilliant idea, and I'll need some money to start. The people who are going to invest will scratch their head price now. If they did once 10 years ago, they'll scratch it three times now to see, show me that your idea will really work. Well, to show, you need data. If you have data, you need to do all these tests. So it becomes harder and harder to actually bring innovation into the marketplace. Now, if you could step back and ask a bigger question, do you want innovation when there are a lot more people who don't have access to even simple health care? So that's a, a big ethical question. So there's business and ethics to be balanced here. And there are no real easy answers to this. I mean, if there were, they would be all implemented. But I'm talking from an innovation perspective, <coughs> it is likely to slow down because you need money, you need investment to actually build on the research. It may lead to what is changing in business models. So previously, you start a company, you know, IPO, and, and you sit, take it public, you get money. Then you move into the more acquisitions model. You develop, you have a company, you start selling it in some other countries, especially in the US. Bigger companies come and acquire you, and so you're happy in, in the US. But now, for all these companies and for the start, you need initial investment. If they're going to the VCs, the venture capitalists are going to back off because of the increased risk and timeline, those small companies don't, they can't survive. So it may lead to change to different business models where bigger companies may need to actually start funding some of these things. And again, this is very much evolving. This is brand new, this is just in the last few years, so we don't know how this is going to all you know, map out. Um, but the ultimate goal for government and for the companies is to actually extend these therapies to much broader patient groups. It's good for the patients, it's actually good for the investors. So it's kind of a fine balance of meeting patient need at the same time making a fair, uh, a fair profit. So not only easy, it's easy to say this, um, it's very, very difficult to actually implement this. Um, I just would, I think I'll stop there just wanted to give you a, a flavor of that. So with that, I'll open the floor up to any questions. Yeah, you uh, quite extensively talked about uh, the cost involved in all this. How much of um, you know, uh, ideas like uh, machine intelligence and uh, simulations, you know, extensive Data, using all of that to do basically predictions 
The problem will be convincing the regulators. I mean, on the regulator side too, I didn't go into this detail. On the FDA side, you have all scientists there. So they are scientists too. So they know, they are from you know, FDHDs too, and they know the science behind it. The key is to what is called validating the, the automate, automated process. Correlating that to the actual data. Now that is not very easy in some cases. Some cases it is easily done. Final element analysis is more technical. <coughs> Rather than testing every device and pulling it to failure, you can do some analysis. But again, that has to be validated. So the key will be one, validating it very robustly. Two, selling it to regulators and you know to to actually um, convince them that this is a very good um, surrogate for the actual testing of this process. And I think if we make scientific sense, which uh, you know, the agencies are open uh, to that, depends also a little bit on the, the reviewer side of things. Some of them are more conservative, some of them are not. So, so that's a very good point. It can actually really save millions. It's just developing these tools also costs money. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, they're not cheap. So, it's. I think there will be a lot of that uh, in this whole system of uh, where you want to really surprise. Them. There are certain materials that uh, uh, I don't know whether you call them like drug or uh, or device. Uh, let's say that uh, the materials that you use uh, in the form of powder, powder or patches to uh, uh, stop bleeding when the surgeons are doing the uh, surgery. Okay. So, so what uh, would you call these drugs, or you call them devices? From what I know, that just stopping the bleeding physically, like forming a, a clot or something, yeah. probably would be a device. But they use it by doing internally. I mean, yeah. Like doing it can be internally. internally. Yeah. The key again is, is there a chemical action or especially a pharmacological or a metabolic action, whether the cell cycle, yeah. you know, the, the cell machinery is used where it, the product has been broken down and then that product is used, yeah. uh, the cell receptors are involved. So that's the way they determine that. If it's just a physical thing forming a clot right there, that still would probably be a If I take the pig chubby, mm -hmm. and in that case, it can go and clot that way. So basically, you just get it from uh, the other human being or the pig, and then use it for human I mean, in surgery. Yeah, I think most likely it could be a, a device. Um, again, there was always the details, and you know, you have to actually file it with the FDA. Unless there is something in the clotting cascade of the blood, which a component in that uh, is actually affecting the, um, which that's a whole biology side of the thing. Now, in, in the uh, in uh, this type of uh, research and so on, uh, is it more what? Uh, I would like to know that if you talked about the medical studies, the engineering studies. What, what part of engineering basically becomes uh, more apparent here? Really? It depends on the type of device. If it's a pacemaker, for example, it's electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. It's very miniature, so it essentially generates a pulse generator, essentially. Yeah. While stents, it's essentially mechanical engineering and materials. Your materials you know, shouldn't clot. If you clot a coronary artery, that's heart attack right there. So, so on that side, it would be mechanical engineering and materials engineering. Pulse generators, it would be um, Electrical engineering. Um, the other branches, I mean, software part of it, obviously, would be more into the programming aspects of that. So, still CS, EE category. Um, some of these devices where there's fluid flow, a little bit of fluid flow, <coughs> but I would put that under mechanical engineering. Uh, so, those are chemical engineering. Um, so, in the case of uh, biomedical engineering, uh, or I'm sorry, bioengineering, that's what comes in our. It seems to me that one needs to be focused and then see what areas in, um, uh, you would like to you know, <coughs> have the study or education, right? Can you just uh, give us some idea on that? On what areas to focus? Yeah. I think the main thing is to focus on the fundamentals of mechanical sciences, electrical sciences. Those are the big, I mean, traditional engineering is split up. You know, electrical sciences, mechanical sciences. And, uh, material. and material science. Yeah. So that's where the split up is. 
I think the foundation is, the, the key is to get the foundations strong because all the companies, if you go to the R&D labs, <coughs> your fundamentals on the, either of these yeah. should be strong. It's very difficult to do all three together, mm -hmm. and you can, unless you're triple major or something. And there are very, very few um, devices where all three would be mixed up. Even if they are, principles are involved, they have a separate electrical engineering team, separate mechanical engineering team, so you wouldn't need to know all three. But to get the fundamentals, in any of these basic three sciences would be uh, a good starting point. Yeah. Now, under materials, you have a lot of chemi chemistry side of the materials too, the surface sciences. So under each category, you will have much more fine and gradation. So it depends on the type of industry. But mostly, um, I would say mechanical, electrical, and materials would be the, the main thing. So in things like, for fact, let's say for a master's degree and so on, Skills to be developed to the score, to the core quantitative and uh, understanding quantitative skills and analysis and thinking. It's the rational thinking process that uh, needs to be developed. And also the biology aspect. Of it. Yes. Uh, the engineer do not have any, any background in that. Yeah, and uh, that's very that, that's where the more biomedical side of things come in is to develop the biology side of it. And that's a totally different family of thinking essentially. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated. Engineering systems are sometimes you know, steel is steel, you have a plastic modulus and the Poisson ratio. But then biomaterials are much more sophisticated than that, even if you can simply model that. <coughs> the biology side, and then there are living cells which live in the tissues. So the cell itself is a big machine. So, so the biology side is very, very important. Um, but mainly from the engineering side, the foundation of engineering is what's then you build up on top of it. Question there? Uh, yeah, in your definition of a medical device, you quoted the FDA as saying that the device cannot rely on chemical action on metabolism to achieve its primary intended purpose. The word primary sounds like a loophole. Are there secondary purposes that could allow for chemical action on metabolism? Mm. Yes, and this is a whole broad topic. Um, if you put a polymer, polymeric material instead of plastic, let's say polyglycolic acid, PLGA. It's going to get broken down in your body. So there is a chemical action that's going on. PLGA is polylactic glycolic acid. If you know the basics of biochemistry, lactic acid and glycolic acid are components in your body. It's happening in your glycolysis, so it just breaks it down. But say let's take a bone screw. Bone screw is the, you know, it's made out of PLGA sometimes, or bone plug. The primary purpose of that screw is to hold the bone together so that the interface of the bone can heal. Now, at the same time, it's chemically it's degrading while the bone is healing. But it is not achieving its primary purpose, i.e., holding the bone together through the chemical action. Chemical action is degrading it, that's happening <coughs> on the side. So that's the, that's the caveat there, primary. Now, the whole combination product world brings in this discussion a little bit more lively. When you have a drug in a stent, um, the primary mode of action is opening up the blood vessel. That is still done by the, the walls of the stent. So it's primarily a device with what's called an ancillary action of a drug, uh, which actually keeps the cells from proliferating and close to the artery. So there's both mechanisms, but still the primary action there is keeping the vessel open. This is it's a very, very complex discussion, and this is <coughs> the way which pathway a device goes into will determine the duration it takes for approval. If it's a primary drug, it's reviewed by the branch in FDA called CEDAR. And CEDAR is very tough. And because they're, they look at it from a drug perspective, and they have to do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C to get that approved. While the device needs P, Q, and R to get approved. So companies look at the time of approval. Remember the three to five to seven years of approval? It's, it's more money invested for them. So um, again, but the, ultimately it will be the science that rules. It, both sides of the company and to the FDA agree, yeah, the primary mode of action is a device. Then it will be classified primarily as a device, but still there will be a drug there. But to answer that question, the best example is think of a bone screw or something. I mean, it is degrading in size, but that's not the way it's achieving what it's supposed to achieve. Now, if you take a plastic and say, I put the polymer there and it's supposed to heal, so it's a bone plug of the same material, but let's say that it's made up of material where if it breaks down, it actually heals, essentially it becomes a drug there. It is then, and again, depends on what we claim it does. If 
let's say like it is used to heal the bone by putting that in a way of by rooting and breaking down, at that point it could be classified as a drug, even if it's made out of uh, the same polymer. So what do you claim it is used and how it intends it how it achieves its claimed purpose primarily is what puts it under this 